Okay, thank you. Our um, training session is called to order, and I will turn it over to Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Superintendent, members of the board. I understand that you all have eight hours of training and you need your ninth hour before June 30th to stay legal. And so uh, the totality of our goal this afternoon in the next hour is to get you that, that credit. Um, and, and maybe that's as high as we're willing to set the bar at this point. Um, but fortunately, it's not gonna be me doing most of the training, so there is hope. I want to introduce to you all a new colleague of, of mine and of our Ed Group team. His name is Michael Walker. Many of you have had a chance to meet him. He joined us in January and um, most recently served as Chief Legal Officer for a, a large Metro Atlanta school district and has been uh, in this line of work representing boards for over 10 years and practicing several years more than that. Um, and the topic today, as you can see from the PowerPoint, and I'm going to hand something out in just uh, a couple minutes, is a few hot topics in education law. So we're just going to sort of talk about a sampling of items that we thought might be of interest to you. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, we are first going to jazz it up a little bit. And I, I kind of want to call attention to the work. This is not a legal point. It doesn't have anything to do with the law, but it's just an interesting observation maybe that highlights the work that happens in your school district every day and every year. Um, and the enormity of it, I think, is lost on us sometimes and maybe everyone in the community. And, and so if we can go to the next slide. Um, just looking at some of the numbers that pertain to what happens. It's not a great way to capture all the stories of all the work that the teachers do and the work that people who support teachers does, as the superintendent points out. And so I want to see if the board members can help us. Maybe they can get a lifeline from the superintendent or not. I'll let y'all figure that out. Uh, what those numbers represent and just sort of going one by one and picking the, the numbers on the screen and tell me what they are. Uh, oh, it's not working. 717. Well, they're different. They're different numbers. I thought seven hundred seventeen thousand was the amount we expected to collect from SPLOS. Well, it's close. That's the population of your county. Oh. <laughs> One hundred twelve thousand number may look familiar to some of you. That's the number of students. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I think no so the the seven the um, 68,000 is the transportation miles per day that your buses put on uh, that's student transportation that's correct you're the 24th largest district in the country uh, 114 y'all recognize that number that's the number of schools um, 44.8% are students eligible for free and reduced lunch, which is just one metric that can describe some of the challenges with um, educating students. And I think the only number that we haven't covered is going to be 75.5%, which is the graduates enrolled post-secondary in the year after graduation, um, which Oh, that's that's correct. It's a, it's a related number. Graduation. That's the graduation rate. Very good. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, um, if y'all ever want to make reference to that, we just included that slide. And again, I think it just captures uh, a little bit of what you all work with every day, and you're to be commended for that. With that having been said, we're going to dive right in, um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Walker to come up and walk us through a discussion here for the next few minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, 
Members of the board, Mr. Superintendent, uh, as Clem indicated, my name is Michael Walker. I'm with the firm, and it's really a pleasure to be here uh, in Cobb County. And I'll be happy to address these hot topics, legal issues that we're going to be dealing with today and be happy to field your questions at any time. Don't feel free to or don't uh, feel constrained to save them till the end. Fire away uh, at will and we'll do our best to field them. Uh, we've got the agenda up on the on the screen and you can see we're going to cover some hot topics there. The first three bullet points, cameras in the classrooms, corporal punishment and robocalls. And then the last one, not so much of a hot topic, but interesting nevertheless, and, and, uh, and Clem will probably have some thoughts and ideas about parliamentary procedure if we can get there. I have my clear marching orders. We need an hour of training. We don't need more than an hour of training. So we'll see if we get to the end of the presentation. Without further ado, then, we will dive into our first hot topic of the day and that is cameras in the classroom. And we consider this a hot topic because uh, next week we expect that the governor uh, will sign House Bill 614, known as the Landon Dunson Act. Uh, this is a bit of legislation that there was some effort last year to get passed. It didn't work, uh, it was uh, the product of some late in the session activity, but it didn't get passed. It did pass this year. The expectation is that Governor Deal will sign the law next week. And with the adoption of the law, Georgia will become only the second state in the country to authorize video cameras in self-contained special ed classrooms. Now, this law being passed does not impose any affirmative responsibilities on the school district. At this point, participation by local school districts is voluntary. And the legislation as passed invites the State Department of Education to develop some guidelines uh, on, on how local school districts would roll that out should they choose to participate in it. For the districts that do uh, participate in the program, there are some restrictions about access to the video footage. There are also some requirements regarding uh, retention of the video footage, uh, how long the videos have to be maintained by the district. There's also some broad parameters around uh, how the cameras would have to be uh, provide coverage in individual classrooms, but it's really based on practicality. So the law as it is does not provide any particular mandates, and there's still a lot of areas that would need to be filled out and developed by the State Department of Education, but it, it is now an option that's available to school districts, and it's, it's a hot topic because it takes us just another step in the direction of, of technology in our schools, a path that we're already well down, and, and there's, there's no end in sight. We're going to be going in that direction, I'm sure, uh, for the duration. Please. So does that specifically limit the camera utilization to self-contained special education classrooms? It allows them in the special education classrooms. Uh, there is no law that I'm familiar with that allows them in other education classrooms as a matter of course. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm not familiar with whether there is actually a general rule of application regarding the use of cameras in classrooms. Certainly, for security purposes primarily, they are in the hallways and other common areas, but being in the classrooms installed, uh, I don't believe that there are any rules that, that govern that. This, I, this, the push for this particular legislation, I think, was the result of some fairly high-profile cases involving some misconduct involving some of our uh, uh, students with special needs. And so rather than embrace the whole subject of cameras everywhere, uh, this was to provide an additional layer of monitoring and assurances for the, in those classrooms where we have our students with greatest vulnerabilities. The, um, and I'm not aware of any restrictions on bringing cameras into the classroom. It would, the thing that's restricted more is just the privacy aspects on how the footage would be utilized. Um, but, and at the same time, this law is, is, I think, seen as the front end of the wedge into sort of our future with the, the relationship between cameras, whether we see this with police officers and body cameras uh, and a number of other contexts. It, it seems like it's going this way, and it rarely goes backwards uh, from, the, from the standpoint of momentum. Madam Chair. <clears throat> Could you give us a definition of what you, of self-contained, because you use that phrase 
uh, as to special needs, it has to be self-contained. What does that really mean? <laughs> uh, I would defer to uh, those who have more ed ed expertise in the special education field, but self-contained is a particular designation for special ed students where there are special ed students in a particular classroom. And not, not um, if I could say, uh, mixed in with general education students. Right, so the, the, the statute refers to the situation where the only children in the classroom will be special, special needs children. And, and quite frequently that is children with uh, uh, more severe special needs. Not in the interrelated setting. And I keep waiting for uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth to start sh you know, shaking her head and then I'm gonna let her pick up from where I'm missing it. But as Clem mentioned, uh, we, do, we do view this as a spearhead, and of course we already deal with, with issues regarding uh, videos uh, in our schools, whether they're videos that we're responsible for, or whether they're videos that, that are taken by our community members, our students, our staff, uh, we have to deal with those videos. So the issue of surveillance has been a, a hot issue in schools for a while and continues to be a hot topic. So we looked at, at, at pairing these two things together, and really this is what we want to uh, spend a little bit of time getting into because it does, as I say, continue to be a challenge for school districts. Uh, the education community has been waiting for a long time for uh, the United States Department of Education, uh, the Family Policy Compliance Office, or the FPCO, to provide some updated guidance on the subject of the disclosability of surveillance videos or other video materials that include images of students. Uh, the last formal guidance that we received from the FPCO was in 2004. And so we're now 12 years down the road, and of course in the technology world, 12 years is more than a couple of lifetimes. This ongoing lack of formal guidance has been a challenge for us uh, at the local level at this time when more and more videos are being created, whether it's classrooms in the camera, or cameras in the classroom, I beg your pardon, or whether it's cameras in the hallway, or whether it's cameras on cell phones, or what have you, there are more and more videos being taken, there are more and more videos being requested. And how we deal with that and how we are allowed to deal with that is a, a real source of ongoing uh, friction. And uh, as I say, the most recent guidance from FPCO was issued in 2004, 12 years ago. At that time, the FPCO, which is a, an office of the U.S. Department of Education, and they're responsible for interpreting uh, FERPA, and so that's why we look to them for guidance, uh, they considered surveillance videos to be FERPA-protected education records of all of the students who were in a video. So if you have a, a hallway camera and you can see 100 students, based on the guidance from 2004, the idea was that that would be an education record for any student who was identifiable in that video. And so that essentially sets the bar that we're dealing with, and that's a fairly narrow and, and, and strict application of the FERPA rules to student videos, and it's still controlling authority. What that means then is for someone who wants to request that record, because it's an education record for every student who's shown in that video, if someone wanted to inspect that record, or if somebody wanted a copy of that record, they could not obtain it unless they could get a waiver of FERPA rights for every other student and family associated with that video, or unless you could successfully redact the video. Now in 2004, redaction was a little more challenging and a little more costly than it is now, but even now it's not something that all districts are equipped to do on a regular basis. It still takes time, it still takes resources, and of course those are, those are a rarity. The most common example that we deal with in this area is arguably uh, videos that include uh, fights or other infractions involving students where we want to get to the bottom of it. So a video that's depicting a fight involving multiple students, uh, based on the 2004 guidelines, it, it could not be viewed by a family uh, of any of the students without waivers of all of the families. Again, unless you could sufficiently redact the video or if you could get waivers from those other families. Yes, ma'am. So whose responsibility is it to, to get those waivers? Is that the, the school system or the family requesting it? 
certainly school systems can work with their community relations or, or take a community relations approach that they want to. They have no obligation to. In other words, if a family were to request that video, you could inform the family that without the benefit of the waiver from the other family members, we're not able to release this to you. And that, that could be the end of the conversation. Now, you could provide them with waiver forms that they could use to approach those families. Well, we, we wouldn't even be allowed to tell them which families were involved. Correct. So that's true. Presumably the students would have permission. some idea of who's involved and so the students might be able to collaborate. I mean, I've, I've had experiences where the family members already all know each other, but for one reason and not, it's not uncommon for perhaps maybe the primary actor is the one who's least interested in giving everybody else permission to see the video. Right. They will be the lone holdout. But all the family members are familiar with each other just because of the, the nature of things. They understand who else is in the video, and it may be that you've got five families and four are all okay viewing it, but that fifth one doesn't want mm -hmm. you to. That fifth one does have the veto power under the 2004 guidance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But you are right. We couldn't, we couldn't volunteer that information if it wasn't otherwise known. We could simply notify the families that were not able to do it. We could provide them with the forms. Now. Again, these are, uh, these are kind of a case-by-case -case analysis, but if you were worried about how those families might get along, how the students are getting along, do you necessarily want to send them in the direction of on their own approaching a family member or another family to get that kind of release? That particularly may be asking, if it was a fight. <laughs> particularly if it was a fight. So yeah. those you handle carefully. And that applies to all videos, correct? That Where applies students to, are in. That applies to all videos Yes, this scenario really contemplates that it's a video that the school district has possession of. My specific thought is uh, regarding bus cameras. Okay. So if a parent requests to view a video, then this waiver environment applies. It does. Okay. In fact, yes, bus cameras in most districts are distinct from, distinct from uh, hallway cameras or other, or other security cameras. It's not uncommon for school districts to have their, their property-based security cameras to be administered and monitored by their, what is considered under FERPA to be their law enforcement unit or their security staff. So, because they're primarily security videos. It's also not uncommon for school districts to have video cameras in their transportation fleet and those cameras are not administered or monitored by the security force. In that situation, any video that's taken on the bus cameras is going to be potentially purely an education record. And we'll get into this just a little bit, but it's a critical distinction under FERPA because records that are the, the domain of the law enforcement unit are specifically excluded under FERPA, so they're not education records. So if you've got a video and it is taken and maintained by your security force. They're the only part of your school district that has access to the video. They're the only ones who are using it. Then at that point in time, that video is arguably not an education record and is fairly broadly disclosable. Since these scenarios often involve student discipline or other education related purposes, it's not uncommon for a school leader or someone in the administration to obtain a copy of the video and at that point, what began its life as a law enforcement unit record gets essentially converted into an education record and it then enjoys FERPA protection. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ragsdale. How about somebody with a camera, like a kid, filming a fight or something? How does that? With the school, does that become a school record? It can become a school record. So that's going to de depend on whether or not the school takes possession of that phone or has the basis to do that, or if the, the student or the family member volunteers it. But when it begins its life on the student's camera, it is simply uh, a record that belongs to that student. And it's not until the, the school district or the school has possession or control of that video that it even can potentially become an education record. Well, what, what happens when that thing goes, like, is called viral or something, they start sending it to all their friends. You, the school district doesn't have control of that. And, you, and we've, we've even seen um, in, in other parts of the state websites that gather student fights. 
um, in a, in, a, in particular schools, and there's not a great answer to that because it's not a record that's ever been in the in the control of the school district. So people can go to news media or upload these to social media or websites. Um, so so you you are starting to see some examples of that problem. Until we have the ability to exercise any control over that video, it is really beyond our control. It's, it's outside of our authority. And so what is done with it, there's very little that we can do about it. Uh, with the new cyberbullying rules uh, that were passed in the last legislative session, conceivably there might be a little more opportunity for school districts to get involved if the use of that video is involved in cyberbullying type activity. Uh, but outside of that context, unless the families volunteer the video or some other way comes into the control of the school district, as Clem indicated, if they're wanting to post it online, there's very little we can do about it. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to be clarify on that, uh, what Clem and you were saying, uh, once it gets out in the, into the Internet, do, do, they, do they still have ownership or has it become public domain? Uh, I think once something's posted online, uh, it's really going to be incumbent upon them to try and get it down, and, and good luck with that. So, but my point being is, once we get a copy from the from the internet, then that's our copy, right? Sure. If we, yeah, if we have taken it and we're using it for disciplinary purposes or for some other educated related purpose, to the extent that somebody asks for it from us, we have FERPA uh, guidance that we can look to. If it's out there on the internet. It could be that no one's going to ask us for it because they can just go get it on their own. Most often, the, the, in the pre-videos everywhere world, these were records that really were created and maintained only by the school district. So the only place you could get them was to go to the school district. Now, there, these video records can be at multiple sources. And, and so sometimes they come to us for them and sometimes they don't. And when we say we can't give them the records that they're asking for, it's not uncommon for them to go to other agencies. So we'll very often be dealing with a records request simultaneously coming to us and one that is going to a local law enforcement agency. We both have a copy of the record. And if it's, for example, a, a media requester, they may come at both of us just to see who they can you know, make the most compelling argument to try and get a copy of it. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, I'm not. I think we veered off there a little bit. When you said they take it down, but we've already made a copy of it, do they still own the rights? Well, I think we may be talking about two different things. That that video may exist once it's been posted online. It may be replicated a thousand times, and it can exist in a thousand different places. If we have the record, our version of the record or our copy of the record will likely enjoy FERPA protection. But there are so many other iterations of the record out there I don't know how often people would actually come to us for it. The protection that we enjoy for our records does not go beyond our records. So, so if we just if we obtain a copy, and it's our record, that really only applies to the situation where someone's asking for it from the school district. It really doesn't touch anything about what's available online. We we have no control over that realm. Thank you. We could try if you like, but good luck. <laughs> no, I, I was trying to, what Mr. Wheeler said is, it belongs to them when it's on their phone. They share it with the world. Then mom and dad get a hold of it and say, get that off of your website. So the young man or young woman takes it down off and they, and they want all their copies back. Good luck with that. But do, technically, do they still own all the copies? That's all I'm asking. Yeah. Well, uh, probably not if, if they were uploaded. And see, then the uploads get downloaded in, other, in various places, and there's probably not protection of the, of the ownership rights there. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Susan. Yes. When you refer to uh, Ferber, the, the 2004, you're, you're indicating in your narrative here that there's been some uh, leniency granted, but FERFA is a law. Correct. So the legal aspect of the law has not changed. It's, uh, it, uh, it's their interpretations of the law that are that's evolving. 
That's a perfect segue, I think, uh, to our next point. Thank you, Mr. So, Banks. <laughs> it's so a good question. And now, is House Bill 614 just a subset, or is it a totally different direction of FERPA? So FERPA is a federal law, and one of the reasons that we have so much uh, ambiguity is that FERPA uh, really only has a few operative terms, and one of which is what is an education record? And okay. the definition of education record is very vague, and it involves terms like personally identifiable information. Well, what is personally identifiable? It's the kind of legal analysis that you just, you ask more questions than you find answers. But when it comes to video footage, a fundamental question is whether a, a video recording that depicts a student is an education record. Now, there is a, a <coughs> small minority of legal scholars and courts that believe they're not education records at all. Then there are others who believe mm -hmm. that they are education records, but that other provisions from FERPA apply. In other words, parents should have the right to inspect them because they're education records. And then there is the position that we take uh, regarding the 2004 guidance, which is, <clears throat> yes, their education records and no, they can't be seen by uh, their education records for everyone uh, and they can't be seen by anyone without appropriate waivers or redaction. So there's that, there's that range of opinions based on what is the definition of an education record and what rights does FERPA give to parents to inspect education records. Okay, now in your narrative, you talk about the courts and that they are, they're bound by the 2004 FERPA Act. Now the court, would it take in consideration leniency, you know, the change in uh, the evolve, evolvement of the len leniency as far as what is education and not education, which, you know, if you're having a fight, that's not education, I mean, it, it, you know, you may be learning some things, but not the what we want you to learn. But uh, is is the uh, is is the court absolutely bound to the act itself? So I'll add, the court is bound by the law, and the law is the FERPA law. The 2004 guidance that we got from FPCO is a bit of guidance from the federal office that is responsible for interpreting the law. So this is a little bit, you know, legally in the weeds, but courts are not required to follow guidance from such offices. It can be considered authority, it can be considered persuasive, but courts are not required to. So in other words, this 2004 guidance is a federal office's interpretation of a federal law. Courts are not required to adhere to it, and some courts don't. Some courts say, I understand what FPCO says, I disagree, and courts are allowed to do that. The majority of courts will show deference to the FPCO's guidance and interpretation because they are allowed to, and they recognize that this is the FPCO's function. This is why they exist, to administer and interpret the FERPA law, and so if this is how they say it should be interpreted, I'm going to defer to their interpretation. And the majority of courts will defer to those interpretations, but they're not obliged to. And so some courts will say, thank you, but no thank you. Do we have case law that would back us up? Mr. If, Mr. Doyle? I'm going to let Mr. Walk, Walker answer the question, but I think um, what I would say about the position that we take as a school district is that we are interpreting FERPA to protect quite a bit of video information. We're not willing to start turning over videos um, with other students' images and actions in them, and we feel like we can uh, prevail in that argument in court. Mr. Walker's illustrating that there's, uh, it's, it's similar to an attorney general opinion. It, it's, it's an opinion, but it's, we're not really bound by it. Um, at, at the same time, this is a hot topic, and um, there's increasing efforts to make hallway videos, bus videos, et cetera, public information. 
And uh, that's something that's, that I think is concerning to a lot of educators. Well, so <clears throat> let, me, let me give you an example. We often see videos of, of fight in, a, in the hallway and suspension occurs. And so we review it and we decide as a board to uphold or not uphold. And the parents, before we get to it, actually gets to see it also. Now, from what I understand you're saying is if there's a bunch of students there, those parents cannot see that video. Is that, am I understanding yeah, it, it correctly? At, at times, um, it, this has been a, an issue. We've worked with Mr. York going back several years, and there are times where that has been done on a school-to-school -school basis. It, it's not always handled consistently just because I think sometimes principals are in very difficult positions. They get parents showing up. Um, and so I, I don't know how it's going to be resolved in the okay. end. I, and I And I do recognize that... Um, the consistency hasn't always been there, but you can imagine these are there's always just very different scenarios that the school principals are facing. Well, let me just say, true to nature, federal government screws things up. I will try to address one question about legal authority. Yes, courts, both in Georgia state courts as well as the federal courts uh, in the 11th Circuit, routinely uphold the, the protections of these records. So we are on strong legal footing in protecting the privacy of these records. Where you really have the, the point of contention is going to be where you have a family member who wants to view a video who is not being allowed to view a video because another family member will not agree to allow them. That's really the disagreement that you have to, that you would anticipate having a problem with. There are legal scholars and some courts who do say that the right of the family to view that video trumps the privacy rights of the family who does not want them to view it or does not, is not willing to give permission to view it. And if we can't redact it, then they can't see it. There, are, there is more and growing support for that position. But the, the guidance that we get from the FPCO still says that at least for the students who are the focus of the video, the two students or the three students who were involved in the fight, it's an education record for those students and without waivers for all of them, then no one can see the video. That's, if we take that position, that is a legally viable position and it's a defensible position. As I say, there is a move and FERPA in their informal guidance seems to be giving some in indication that they're going to uh, lower those standards, but we've been waiting for 12 years and they haven't done it yet. And what's interesting is the trend could now be kind of getting into a cross current with more and more interest in bullying related issues. So now school districts have an ever increasing responsibility to be mindful of bullying and bullying related issues and harassment issues and these videos could certainly inform that conversation and that discussion which might send us right back in the direction of making them protected education records for all of the students shown in the video because it's conceivably or potentially could be involved in a bullying situation that's beyond just the two combatants in a fight for example so this is definitely a, a fuzzy fuzzy crystal ball it's very foggy don't know exactly which way uh, we're going on this thank you uh, Michael on if both want to see, I mean, grant waivers to see it, but the school system for legitimate reasons, whatever that may be, doesn't believe they should see it. Is that a, is that a uh, position that we can stand on? The, the trick that we would have there is that very often people think of FERPA as a, as a privacy law, and it does have privacy components, but the actual primary purpose of FERPA is to ensure the accessibility of, of education records for students and their families. So uh, if families are willing to give waivers and want to inspect those records, I, that would be a very tall order for the school district to be able to deny them the ability to inspect those records. Now, there's a difference between inspect and get a copy that you can go do something with. Uh, when there's a very tricky situation, I've heard of school districts, rather than allowing families to inspect the video, they will describe the video and characterize what is shown on the video so that at least the families have some idea. But even that, if you've got a, an aggressive family member who is familiar with their rights under FERPA, they may insist on being allowed to inspect that video. And if there are no waiver restrictions, in other words, if all the families involved have, have permitted that, uh, that'd be a tall order to, to not allow the inspection of that video. 
Okay, uh, real quick follow up. If one person got injured enough that the other family uh, filed a police report or you know assault, aggravated assault or whatever, the police asked for that video. Does it become evidence then and can be viewed publicly no matter what purpose says? Uh, if the police get a copy of the video, in my experience, law enforcement will, uh, at least during the pendency of their investigation, keep pretty close uh, wraps on the video after their investigation is done. If they retain it, uh, particularly if it's used in prosecution, then there's a greater likelihood that it's going to get into the court system and be available. Uh, sometimes you will have, I think, uh, diligent and, and responsible law enforcement officers recognizing videos involving minors, and they'll take appropriate precautions just to disguise the identity of minors. But once the video gets outside of the control of the school district, our ability to keep it under wraps is, is fairly limited. Uh, it, you would have to take some pretty extraordinary measures to try and keep that video as contained as you might like it to be. And this is one of the frictions that we deal with in FERPA. We want to protect the privacy of our students, uh, but there are competing interests that uh, uh, we sometimes have to acquiesce to. Uh, I'll, I think we've had a chance to uh, explore this uh, and we've covered some of the dissenting viewpoints. Uh, this slide here again just represents that Georgia courts and federal courts in, in the 11th Circuit do uh, uphold the position that we take uh, and the 2004 guidance is still uh, viable legal authority. Um, this just touches on the law enforcement unit uh, notion that we talked about earlier, so you can review those materials, and if there's any questions, we'd be happy to address them. Um, that, you know, we've also touched on some questions about bus cameras and handheld devices. The source of videos, there's lots of different sources of videos, and for all the different sources of videos, you'll have to ask a whole new set of questions on who controls the video and who has the responsibility to either maintain its confidentiality or, conversely, to disclose it. Hopefully, uh, the FPCO will issue some new guidance on this. Um, I've been watching this issue as long as I've been representing school districts, and when I go to conferences, I, I meet people who are also watching it, and we all say, have you heard anything? Is there, it, what are the tea leaves saying? When are we going to hear from FPCO? Nobody knows. As long as we like the guidance that they issue, <laughs> then, then we're, we'll accept it. Okay, so that moves us on. Uh, since we're talking about videos, uh, we'll move on to our next hot topic. And we decided to go against the video in this case. You may recognize just from the still shot on the screen in front of you, this was a video uh, that was in the news here just in the last several days. It's, uh, it's a difficult video to watch, but it involves corporal punishment being administered to a very young student uh, here in Georgia. And it has elicited uh, quite a bit of conversation, uh, both in Georgia and nationwide regarding corporal punishment. Uh, majority of the states in the country have uh, per banned corporal punishment in schools, and, and approximately half of the districts in Georgia have also banned corporal punishment. Uh, you can rest easy. Cobb County has also pro prohibited uh, corporal punishment. It's not allowed in our schools. The administrative rule, JCDR, expressly provides that corporal punishment shall not be used as a disciplinary procedure in the district. So. Uh, the video that we see from the other school district in Georgia is not one that's uh, likely to be seen here. Yes, sir. Just curious, what's the statute of limitations on that? <laughs> on? <laughs> <laughs> Who else on the board has had corporal punishment in Cobb County? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, it's not exactly the question that you answer, but I'll go ahead and answer. The, there's another, there's a Georgia statute that also pride, provides pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive immunity for educators who administer corporal punishment. So there's, uh, there's always immunity. Question, it says corporal punishment should not be used as a disciplinary procedure in the district. Would there be any other procedure that it should be for? I mean, it's a it's a good question. I think this this I'm going to guess here without knowing the history that this policy was drafted with the Georgia law in mind. The, the Georgia statute basically gives school districts the individual discretion to decide whether they want to 
uh, use corporal punishment as a form of discipline. And for those school districts who do use corporal punishment, there are fairly specific statutory guidelines on what they have to do. Uh, and so it is, it really can't be for anything other than disciplinary purposes. But I think the spirit of the question is gonna come up here and it's, it, it's really the critical question. So we'll move on to the next slide and that's, that's the, the but. Uh, corporal punishment sometimes looks like reasonable force. For that matter, corporal punishment sometimes looks like child abuse and reasonable force sometimes looks like child abuse. Where are we on the continuum of how are we going to characterize physical contact with a student? Well, the district doesn't allow corporal punishment, so any physical contact with a student, by definition, can't be corporal punishment because we don't allow it. But the district does have a rule that doesn't exactly condone uh, the use of force, but it expressly contemplates that reasonable force may be used. But corporal punishment is hard to define. It, it has a way of looking like other things. And where that's really going to come into play is when you've got a couple of different uh, situations. One is where you've got an upset family member who wants to maybe go to the criminal courts or to the civil courts and seek some redress against an educator who has used force with their child. We know we don't allow corporal punishment they may not read our policy, so they may go to court and say, this, this teacher used corporal punishment on my child. I'd like to either apply for an arrest warrant for battery, or I'd like to file a civil suit, and they may accuse us of using corporal punishment. So how it's going to be defined can move in a lot of different directions depending on who's defining it. We know it's not corporal punishment because we don't allow corporal punishment, but it could be reasonable force because we contemplate that reasonable force may be used. The same policy that prohibits corporal punishment expressly contemplates the possibility that reasonable force may be used, and a copy of that rule is in front of you. I've highlighted some of the, the pertinent language. You can see, as long as we have good faith, reasonable force can be, uh, is used. Now what's interesting here though is that this rule doesn't really authorize or condone it. What it does is it contemplates under what circumstances the school district will be responsible for providing some defense for that teacher. And so that's a fine point that we would have to work through if we were ever confronting that situation, but just a quick surface superficial reading of this policy, a lot of people would look at this policy as saying that you authorize the use of reasonable force. And there's nothing against that. There's nothing that prohibits you from authorizing the use of reasonable force. That question comes down to more of the, the philosophy of the school district and the school district administration and what they believe are the appropriate mechanisms for classroom management and, and student behavior. Whether you allow reasonable force under certain circumstances, whether you absolutely prohibit it under all but the most extreme circumstances, and for every school district I've been associated with, there are different approaches to what is considered reasonable and when force can be used and it comes up on occasion. In fact, in some places it comes up frequently because you will then have personnel related matters where you've got an educator who has used force that perhaps in their mind they thought was reasonable under the circumstances and the school district may disagree. And they done an investigation and they determined that perhaps the use of force went beyond what might have been reasonable under the circumstances. And then it's no longer, in the school district's opinion, reasonable force, it's something beyond that. And that triggers a whole different set of obligations, and we'll save that for another time. But corporal punishment is, is something that comes up fairly routinely in the Georgia news reports because there will always be an egregious example of it as long as it's allowed, and whenever it does, it raises questions. So the answer to the simple question, do you have corporal punishment in your school district? No, we don't. But what we do have in our district, as with almost every other district that I'm familiar with, are policies that contemplate the use of force under appropriate circumstances, not to mention the use of restraint techniques with students with particular needs. So there's going to be a whole continuum of, of situations where educators are going to be engaged in physical contact with their students, and it's, it's a moving target as to what's gonna be permissible and what's not. And just to, to add on to that, um, really apart from us discussing this is a hot topic, th there's sort of the notion that well, corporal punishment, and a lot of us think of 
paddling when we think of that. And the use of reasonable force, well, we might think a teacher protecting themselves in a hallway or directing, you know, following procedures. Um, but, but we've actually had uh, and are aware of a situation fairly recently in, in Georgia where all these issues came up at a hearing where the teacher was um, facing discipline for uh, contact with a student and making arguments that sort of fused this concept of reasonable force with corporal punishment and, and trying to, to blend those together. So for whatever reason, this is this is being talked about now. And then you have some a video that went viral about an actual um, incidence of corporal punishment where the parent was actually the one in the room that, that recorded it. Um, so it wasn't a mystery or anything like that, although it is very uh, maybe unsettling to watch for for uh, our generation now, even though it was a lot more common uh, maybe in the olden days. You're you're kind of in, in general covering it, but I'll, to be more specific, if an administrator breaks up a fight between two students, okay, you've got to touch them. You get between them. You just sort of push defensively, push them away. Or, and they won't stop fighting. So school systems are really condemned on national TV and state t TV, you know, the thing gets out, nobody stopped it. Well, or a bus driver, you know, won't stop a fight and somebody's getting severely hurt. Part of that, we need to blame on the system, the legal system, and maybe even the school district involved because other people got fired or suspended without pay or whatever because they broke up a fight and now everybody else says I'm not touching anybody you know it doesn't matter what happened so the force is okay breaking up the fight and then the school district says well you shouldn't have done that or but yet one of them's getting really hurt it is a difficult issue to work through I think it would be difficult for the school district to give the directive that you're obliged to break up a fight. Uh, I could imagine a circumstance where you might have the only teacher in the vicinity as somebody of particularly small stature and you might be dealing with two offensive linemen who are fighting. Directing that teacher to get between those two guys in a fight is ill-advised. So a, a bright line rule that says you have to break up fights would probably give you more problems no. than saying never break up no, fights. No, I'm not suggesting that. I was simply going by what this says. Okay. And it, there's such an open interpretation. You could, you could fire or suspend without pay an employee for doing the right thing in everybody else's mind, but it, somebody misinterprets or whatever. Then that has a trickle effect where Nobody's going to break up any anything, you know, no matter how bad it gets. So I'm not suggesting right. that we, the school district, should issue a, a policy where they are obligated to break up a fight. That would be foolish, I think. But I'm suggesting that you could drive a truck through this thing. Whenever you, it's nice when you have, immunity is good for, for all of us, by and large, under the law, and, and one of the necessary concepts of immunity is discretion. So any educator who confronts one of these situations is going to be given wide latitude to exercise discretion in how they address it. Ideally, it's only going to be in those circumstances where someone just goes beyond what anyone objectively could view as reasonable. And so it's, it's the situations in my experience where you go from breaking up the fight to not being able to control the adrenaline and the breaking up the fight then turns to a separate fight, you and the student you've tried to stop as the aggressor. So in situations where I've reviewed, I can say, we're good, we're good, we're good, and this is where it got bad. You were fine when you intervene and you were fine when you put hands on. It's when you decided to throw the punch because you were going to bring a stop to this that you went beyond what we could consider the reasonable use of force. And one of the reasons that it matters is that if we make the determination that it's something beyond reasonable force, then we also have greater options regarding our obligations to provide some representation for that teacher in the event that they do face criminal or civil charges. So it's not uncommon 
to have multiple legal actions going on at once. You've got a criminal a application for an arrest warrant. You've got a civil lawsuit against an educator for a battery. You've got an employment action where we've decided you went beyond what, what is really uh, uh, tolerable uh, under our policy. So now we're disciplining you. We might fire you. And then, of course, the civil lawsuit doesn't just name the teacher, it names us, so then we've got to decide, are we going to defend this person at the same time while we're firing them or disciplining them? They get pretty messy pretty quickly, and in that scenario, being able to identify bright line rules is, is nigh impossible. Just a quick follow-up comment that you may want to comment on. This is exactly why I think we're losing educators. The law and policy should give a level of comfort for those trying to do the right thing and i don't think this does i think there was i will just offer this comment i think there was a recent survey of educators particularly those who leave the profession before they reach the five-year mark and if i'm not mistaken uh maybe number two or three on their list was concerns that they have about their ability to uh, effectively um, engage in what they believe is student ma behavior management Okay, uh, we might be able to get into our third hot topic here in the time that we've got remaining. Um, and that uh, concerns robocalls. Uh, that's a, an informal term, but uh, I think it probably has a pretty common understanding of what we're talking about here. Uh, we'll ask if anybody's ever heard of a 56 million or $168 million phone call. Uh, I, I will posit the idea that such a phone call is in fact a possibility. Uh, in 2000, let's start from the bottom, work our way up. In 2012, a group including Capital One paid $75 million for a phone call. Uh, a year later, in 2013, Bank of America paid $32 million for a phone call. And the year after that, Wells Fargo paid $14.5 million for a phone call. These are just uh, three examples of settlement agreements that were entered into to settle uh, TCPA class action lawsuits. And we're going to get into what the TCPA is and why we're concerned with it. But I will say, uh, in 2014, the, the most recent year you have represented there, in 2014, more than 2,000 class action lawsuits were filed in the United States uh, under the TCPA. TCPA, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's actually a federal law with a little bit of age on it. It's been around on the books for 25 years, uh, but it has definitely come into fashion here in the last three or four years. It was originally passed to protect consumers from telemarketers. Uh, and it concerns not only telephone calls, but also texts and pages and faxes and other communications using the telephone lines. Mm -hmm. Under the TCPA, companies, and for our purposes, companies is going to include schools and school districts, are not allowed to initiate certain calls without prior consent. Violations of the TCPA are potentially costly, since calls to each number made in violation can trigger damages of $500 to $1,500 per call. So if we just scroll back real quickly, just using some round numbers, if 112,000 families in your school district all were to get one robocall and it were to be the kind of robocall that is prohibited under the TCPA, then at the $500 penalty, you could be talking about a $56 million phone call. At the $1,500 penalty, you could be talking about a $168 million phone call. This is somewhat alarmist. These are extreme examples, but as you see from the settlements, they're not uncommon and they do happen. And they're not only limited to banks. I know we see only banks represented in this group, but just last October in 2015, uh, Brevard County School System in Florida, they haven't yet been sued, although the provider of their uh, robocalling services has been sued, and that school district is now reviewing its automated calling procedures to make sure that they're compliance with the TCPA. So the spearhead into the school district world, I think, has, has made its way in. That was a pretty uh, egregious example where the school district used its automated dialing system to uh, speak out in favor of a half-penny sales tax increase. So they were using the, the auto dialer for political purposes. That caught the attention of, of would-be plaintiffs, probably more so than the routine calls that most school districts make, uh, inclement weather emergencies and the like. 
Uh, so they might have been asking for it under those circumstances. But nevertheless, it does, there's a class of plaintiff's lawyers who represent class, uh, classes in these kind of suits, and they can see across the country there are lots of large school districts. The more they use these automated technologies, the more they may be susceptible to calls, uh, to, to actions. A couple of potential violations, and these are potential. A school initiates an automated call to every family in the, in the school just for the sole purpose of announcing an upcoming activity. Okay, that's a potential violation and we'll get into why. Another example, a school district initiates an automated call to all families in the school district for the purposes of announcing that we're aware inclement weather is a possibility, we're keeping an eye on it, we'll let you know what we're going to do as more time passes. So it's kind of the announcement before the announcement kind of call. Again, that's a potential violation, one that we can talk about. Do we have a question? How about a robocall that informs you that your son or daughter has not been in school that day or was late to class? That is, that's very likely to not violate the TCPA because we would make the argument that that concerns an issue of student health and safety and those kinds of calls enjoy the greatest protections under the act. So we'll get through some precautions that we can take because that is a common example as well as the severe weather uh, emergency is a common example that school districts are struggling with. Another common example is the school lockdown calls that may go out. Those are the, in the, the debates that are going on in the FCC, the interested parties who are speaking out on behalf of school districts are raising those examples as the most common examples of the kinds of phone calls that we need to be able to make. I have to be candid with you, unfortunately, even though the FCC acknowledges that those are concerns, they have not yet given us the kind of relief that we're looking for. And so the most recent decision that was issued by the FCC from July of last year, it was dissenting opinions to the majority of opinion that raised the concern that based on the most recent, this July 2015 opinion of the FCC, the dissenters were concerned that there were still open questions on those very topics for school districts and that it was unfair to put school districts in such an uncertain posture moving forward. The FCC, they all of the commissioners seem to acknowledge they need to work on a solution, but until they get to a viable solution in place and issue a ruling, we are in this uncertain posture. So even though the stakes are high and even though there is some uncertainty, the good news is, and there's plenty of good news here, uh, the precautions that you can take to mitigate these risks are pretty straightforward. They're easy to take, and I, and I happen to know that we're well down the road in, in taking these precautions, so we're in pretty good shape. <clears throat> uh, the, and really, they kind of fall into two categories. I'll do the, I'll do the, do the, the top one first. Uh, if one precaution that you can take is that you limit your automated calls to the example that you gave Mr. Wheeler, where it's dealing with some kind of student emergency issue. I'm just curious, if you had a phone call from an assistant principal or a, a nurse or, or an attendance office, it's a personal call, is that considered different than a robocall? Absolutely. The, the TCPA is only concerned with automated calls, and primarily automated calls that involve pre-recorded messages. I mean, conceivably, in, the, in our big high schools, you could have hundreds of tardies a day and the, the administration's not gonna have time to personally call everybody and have that conversation. So in that example, if there was a, if let's say your student attendance software keeps track of tardies and absences, and that has the ability to communicate with your automated calling service, and it triggers a pre-recorded message, your child was tardy or absent from school today, mm -hmm. That would be a call that would fall under the TCPA. The question would be, is it a violation of the TCPA? And that's really going to come under, you know, just in the couple minutes that we have left, it's going to be dependent on a couple of issues. Number one, does it concern either an emergency or something directly related to the health or safety of a child? And I think we have a real strong argument that it does. The other issue, and this gives you the greatest protection across the board, is if you have consent from your families to make these kinds of calls, then you can make calls that go beyond emergency calls. You could make the informative call. 
I don't know that I'd ever recommend that you promote the passage of, a, of a, something that's on a, on a ballot somewhere, but you could make informational calls, you could talk about upcoming events, you could do lots of things. The trick is having the consent of your families to do it, and that's relatively easy to do. You can give them in, in any kind of broad disseminated notice you can let them know that by giving us their phone numbers they're giving us their consent to do that the requirement that we would have to adhere to is that anyone who wants to opt out of that uh, has to be given the opportunity to opt out of it and we have to let them do that pretty much however they want uh, we've got some proposed consent language here uh, this is fairly generic. We uh, are already having some conversations uh, with the administration on getting that language out. In fact, I know there's some publication deadlines uh, uh, for later this week, early next week, and we're, we're working with the district on that. If you've got the consent of your families, you're in good shape. If you're making emergency calls, you're in good shape. If you get outside of those circumstances, you're starting to increase the risk just a little bit and hopefully we'll get some guidance from the FCC and some relief from them on the kinds of calls that I, our communities want to get from us. Uh, we just need to get some support from the, from the commissioners on that. And at that, it's 5.30. I see that's my, my deadline unless, uh, all right. I appreciate Great the time. Great timing. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Very good. Very good. And we look forward to covering the rest of the agenda at some point. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and Madam Chair, we, we uh, do have more on the PowerPoint, but we put it in a form that you can just read through it at your convenience and um, just so you can have that as well. But we wanted to hit those hot topics today. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And unless there's an objection, uh, we will convene into executive session. Okay. And we'll Thank need you. a vote for that, Madam Chair. Okay. That's one of the things oh. we'll need a vote for. All right, we need a motion and a vote. And I know we have personnel this evening. I don't know if, and, and we have land, land and I do and not personnel. believe we have okay. legal. Motion, Mr. Skimhorn makes the motion. Is there a second? Mr. Banks seconds. All those in favor? Okay, we are, we will go into executive session. Thank you.